All right, moving on here, ECG course level one still. We did stepwise approach, preached a sermon on that, talked about sinus rhythms. What is a sinus rhythm and then its variations in normal sinus, the sinus bradycardia, sinus tachycardia, as well as sinus arrhythmia and the exit blocks. And now we're going to talk about atrial rhythms as we move on through here. Several varieties. We already did a thing on atrial fib. We'll talk about it some more here. Then there's atrial flutter. And then there is um, the two, WAP and MAT, that are basically a bunch of PACs. And then there is SVT, that's in finger quotes, because technically SVT is a supraventricular tachycardia, meaning a tachycardia from above the ventricles. Well, a lot of things fall into that bucket. But the common use of that term, the slang or jargon that almost everybody uses to call an SVT is just a narrow subset of those. And again, you're going to want ECG in motion by your side as you work through some of this stuff. You, if you don't have it, you definitely want to uh, look at it in class. So an atrial rhythm can have a bundle branch block. So these may be wide or they may be not wide. It could have an accessory pathway that's making it wide or, could, or not. Uh, there may be ectopic beats in there. So you have one of these atrial rhythms with a PVC. Um, there's lots of variations. Atrial fib, we talked about before, there's no clearly definable P waves. Those are called fibrillatory waves or fib waves. They may be coarse or they may be fine. They may be obvious or they may not be. But it's going to be irregularly irregular, and that's in capital letters, not just so I'll pronounce it slowly. But that is the key. <clears throat> irregularly irregular. No pattern. No pattern. It's real common. It's not a big deal until the rate gets out of control. you got to march it out. you got to use your photo field calipers. What are the P waves doing? And then as soon as you're done with what are the P waves doing, what are the R waves doing? What are the QRSs doing? You're looking at what are the ventricles doing and what are the atria doing, and you're looking at them um, using those calipers, and you've got to be disciplined for that. One other little tip I'll throw in there is that sometimes your eyes will fool you. In the faster atrial fibs, you won't see the irregularity, but your ear will pick it up. So if you will turn the volume up on the monitor, you can hear atrial fib, even if you're not seeing it very well. So we like to use all of our senses to assess patients, and that's where hearing comes in big time. I know the beep, beep, beep of the monitor is irritating at some times, but boy, you can hear some of these rhythms uh, before you can actually see them all that well. Atrial flutter. No clearly definable P waves, but look at those. Those are flutter waves, a, a sawtooth looking wave. It looks like the teeth on a saw blade. It looks like if you ran your finger across there, it would cut you. Flutter waves. And so atrial flutter is going to be regular, whereas atrial fib is irregularly irregular. Atrial flutter is going to be regular unless... It's deciding to change conduction ratios. Well, what's a conduction ratio? It's the number of P's to QRS's. It's the number of flutter waves per QRS. So atrial flutter likes to run at a 2 to 1 conduction rate, or a 3 to 1, or a 4 to 1. And most of the time, it will pick a ratio and hang with it. But if it were to start changing its mind, and go from 4 to 1 to 3 to 1 to 4 to 1 to 2 to 1 to 3 to 1, that would produce an irregular rhythm over the course of a great big long strip. But there would be areas in there that are quite regular. So I don't know, is atrial flutter regular or not? The answer I would say is it's regular unless it's changing conduction ratios, but even if it is, it's regular while it's sticking with the same conduction ratio. Is atrial flutter a big deal? Well, no, it's the rate, the rate, the rate, the rate. Now, the flutter waves are coming at 300 times a minute. So one-to-one -one atrial flutter would not be a good thing. That would be very unstable. Two-to-one atrial flutter, two atria contractions at 300 for every one ventricular, so 150 on the ventricular rate, that may be okay may not be okay, depending on the health of the patient in general. Three to one, your ventricular rate is going to be 100 probably, more or less. 
4 to 1 is going to be in the 70s, more or less. These are not hard and fast numbers. The atria like to flutter in the 300 range. And, um, you know, if that conduction ratio is 2 to 1 and the atria are at 360, then you're going to have a heart rate of 180. Um, but really, 300 is a number it likes to flutter at. And so I'm always suspicious of 150. When I see a heart rate of 150, I look extra careful to see if I can find flutter in there. So that's atrial flutter. And again, watch it on ECG in motion. It's pretty cool. And uh, the beauty of ECG in motion is that it gives you a good idea of what's going on mechanically. And then you can look over the ECG and pair those two things up. So you continue to study electrical and mechanical and the linkage there. Here's some tachycardias that are out there. Atrial fib is going to be irregular. Atrial flutter is going to be regular unless the ratio is changing. And there's an example of the ratio changing. And then there's other stuff that's got to do with PAC. So we probably ought to talk about those. All right, so one PAC that comes in will cause you an irregular rhythm. And so that P wave is going to be a different shape because it came from a different focus. And so you can have two of those, two different foci firing, two different PAC morphologies, two different PAC shapes. And once you get to three, three different foci, three different shapes of PAC, three different shapes of P wave, then it's called wandering atrial pacemaker, WAP. So WAP. So WAP is simply a lot of PACs and it's not just a lot of them it's they're coming from a lot of different places so WAP is a, is PACs coming from three or more different foci three or more different um, ectopic pacing sites and that rate's got to be less than a hundred so WAP is less than a hundred because if it's more than a hundred it's MAT multifocal atrial tack all that is is one atrial pacemaker that's going faster. Going faster. So there's something going on in the atria. The SA node's not getting to speak up. There's something going on in the atria where all these ectopic foci are firing. Is it a big deal? As long as the rate stays okay, it's probably not a big deal. But it tells me there's something wrong in the atria, and I'm very interested in that sort of a thing. Again, ECG in motion is great for this. I keep plugging it, and I can't plug it enough. <clears throat> now, SVT. Technically, any tachycardia above the ventricles falls in the large category of supraventricular tach, or SVT. Sinus tach could be in there. Atrial flutter could be in there. Mat, WAP, a bunch of things could be in there. But what we mean when we say SVT is that it's really one of two things. AV nodal reentry tachycardia or AV reentry tachycardia. Now, the common thing there is the RT, a reentry tachycardia. What it is is a crazy short circuit loop that's in the AV node. When you see this on ECG in motion, you'll never forget it. It's um, dramatic in the way it helps you remember. It's an AV node problem. And while we don't talk in this level one course about how to treat things very much, uh, we want you to, to realize when you see SVT, it's chaos in the AV node, and then you get in your toolbox and you pick out something that will reboot the AV node. So that's why this is going to be important down the road. Mrs. Smith does not need you to know if it's AV nodal reentry tachycardia or AV reentry tachycardia. I don't know. I don't care. Um, it is maybe one of those nice to know. I'm not even sure it's R rated. It might be X rated material. But it's an SVT. It's a crazy, chaotic, short circuit loop. It's in the AV node. If I reboot the AV node, a lot of times I can fix that. You can read more on the specifics, but please don't get all that crazy and confused. And please watch um, that on ECG in motion. Here are some examples of SVT. You really can't see P waves. If you do, there's sometimes a bump after the QRS. Look on the right side in the middle there. It's highlighted in yellow. That's probably a P wave. It's occurring right after the QRS. You don't have to be able to see P waves to call it SVT. What we want to do eventually is we get into tachycardia management, and we spend a couple of sessions on this in the, in the real course. 
a uh, couple of sessions on this. What we're trying to do is decide is this sinus tack or is it SVT? And we'll teach you some rules about how to decide if it's sinus tack or not. Sinus tack doesn't tend to flip on and flip off. Sinus tack tends to gradually increase and gradually decrease and the rate changes a little bit. It varies a little bit over time. Sinus tack is a compensation for something else that's going on. SVT is chaos in the AV node and it flips on like a light switch and then you reboot the AV node and hopefully it flips off. So um, that's one of the things that you that you look for. A sinus tack should have a cause. They should be hypovolemic or hypoxic or scared or hurt or mad or something. Sinus tack should have a cause. The other thing is usually the rate. Now there's those old dogs out there that will say, well, it's 150. 150 is a cutoff. It can't, it can't be sinus tack because it's more than 150. And they talk like that and they've been around a long time and they think they know what they're doing because they don't have a body count piling up and technically that's not right so here's the deal the maximum predicted firing rate of your SA node <clears throat> is 220 minus your age write that on your arm permanent marker sharpie don't wash it off 220 minus your age so if you're 10 years old your maximum rate for sinus tachycardia could be 210 the deal is that the old dogs are working with a bunch of old patients so they rarely see SVT, they rarely see sinus tack that's more than 150. And so, you know, they kind of start making assumptions based on what they call as experience. Just want you to be careful with that because that's a widespread myth out there that sinus tack cannot be more than 160. It's not true. Sinus tack can be at any rate up to 220 minus the patient's age. So anyway, end of sermon, um, atrial rhythms, atrial fib, atrial fib, atrial flutter, wandering atrial pacemaker, multifocal atrial tack, and then the SVTs. We'll do a lot more with these in the real class in scenarios uh, when we're talking about identification and treatment of the patient because the rhythm is their main problem. We want to give you a background and get you started on on that so there you go